Hello, my name is Raj Mehta. In this video lecture, I'm going to be discussing chronic hepatitis B in primary care. Let's begin by reviewing some epidemiology of chronic hepatitis B. Chronic hepatitis B occurs when acute hepatitis B converts into chronic hepatitis B. In this first graph, these are all images from the CDC, we see that the age of an individual tells us how likely they will become a person infected with chronic hepatitis B. For the newborn, more than 90% of newborns who get acute hepatitis B end up getting chronic hepatitis B. It's a very, very high conversion rate. However, as you can see, uh, as the individual gets older, the risk of converting to chronic hepatitis B gets lower and lower. And then around here at the end for adults, for the average adult who gets hepatitis B, acute hepatitis B, only about 5% go on to get chronic hepatitis B. This interesting statistic showing how newborns are highest risk for getting chronic hepatitis B can be seen in the statistic. Those with acute infection tend to be majority adults. With chronic infection, again, majority adults, but the second biggest and the biggest change from acute infections are those newborns and those who get in the perinatal area. And again, that's because those people are much more likely to convert from acute to chronic. This third chart goes over risk factors for hepatitis B. So the main risk factor for this is because it's sexually transmitted are individuals with multiple sexual partners. As you can see, intravenous drug use is also a big one. Another big risk factor for hepatitis B is the area in which you may come. It's endemic in some areas more than others. Let's take a look at a world map. So this is hepatitis B prevalence from around 2005. We can see red demarcates high areas of HPV prevalence, orange intermediate, and gray low. Just so you know, high is about a prevalence of 7% in the general population. Intermediate is about 2 to 7%, and low is less than 2%. And as you can see, Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Asia, a very high prevalence of hepatitis B, um, and so on. I'm in a transition so we can discuss serology for a little bit. Understanding chronic hepatitis B requires us to just briefly review different lab values. Let's start by discussing the acute infection. So the acute infection, you have your hepatitis B virus, your double-stranded DNA, and you have two main antigens that that virus produces, your surface antigen and your E antigen, so surface and E. And in time, in an acute infection, that DNA goes away as the body's immune system fights it. Your surface antigen becomes replaced with antibodies to hepatitis surface antigen, and your E antigen also becomes replaced with antibodies to E. And then usually in a period of time, that DNA is completely gone, and the only thing you're left with is antibody to your hepatitis B surface antigen. In this individual, as you'll notice, your surface antigen will be completely gone once the infection clears. Let's move over to your chronic infection. In your chronic infection, your hepatitis B double-stranded DNA is there, and it never quite clears, unlike the acute infection. It's still there years and years, months and months after you have it. The biggest and most important thing to note here is your hepatitis B surface antigen. Your surface antigen also never clears. It's always there, okay? Your E antigen may or may not clear in chronic hepatitis B infection, but the big thing to come back to is that your surface antigen is present months and months down the line, and your B and hepatitis B DNA is also present. Now, if we look at the liver itself, represented by ALT in the acute infection, when you have that infection, your liver enzymes go very high, but then as you notice down here at the bottom of your curve, when the infection resolves, your liver returns normal, and that's it. Unfortunately, with the chronic infection, your liver enzymes, I'm going to use the yellow here, it goes up and it comes down, but it never completely resolves. And you'll have periods of potential flare when your liver enzymes go up or periods when they're stable. And all this represents is inflammation. Okay, Your liver is going through cellular changes, inflammation, fibrosis, and that's the bad thing about these chronic infections, is this constant damage it does to the liver. Now, screening for hepatitis B is pretty straightforward, okay? You begin by looking at your hepatitis B surface antigen, okay? Right here. And 
if your surface antigen is positive, then you've got hepatitis B. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Now, if it's less than six months up here, that means you probably have acute hepatitis B. And if it clears after six months, that means you've cleared it. However, if your hepatitis B surface antigen is there for more than six months, greater than six months, greater than six months, that means you probably have chronic hepatitis B, okay? And again, coming back here, notice your surface antigen never goes away. Now, if your surface antigen is negative, that's good. That means you do not have an active hepatitis B infection. If your surface antigen is negative and your antibody to hemoglobin B is negative, that means you are naive. You've never been vaccinated, you've never had the infection, and you should get vaccinated because you're naive to this. Right? If your hepatitis B surface antigen is negative, but your antibody is positive, again, that means you have antibodies to it, that means you're immune to it. If you're immune to hepatitis B, you don't need to do anything else. Now, there's two reasons you could be immune to it. You could be immune to it because you're vaccinated, in which case, if I checked antibodies to E and core, so E and core, so if you're negative to these things, that means you don't have an antibody to them. That's because it's you've been vaccinated. You're immune due to vaccination. You've never had the infection. You only have the antibody to the B surface antigen because of the vaccine, and E and core antibodies are negative. On the other hand, if E and B antigens are positive, that means you're immune because you've had the infection. You've had the infection and you've got antibodies to the E and the core. Who should you be screening for hepatitis B? Well, anyone who's at risk. And obviously, patients with multiple uh, sexual partners are going to be at risk. But also, as I showed you in that map, anyone who might be from an endemic area is potentially at risk just because of the high prevalence of hepatitis B in some areas in the world. Next, we're going to discuss what do you do with someone once you've diagnosed chronic hepatitis B. And we're going to review an algorithm, but the basic things we're checking are your liver enzymes, the presence of hepatitis E antigen, and your DNA levels. Okay, Those are the three things we're going to test for, and we'll take a look at why those three things are important. Okay, now we're going to talk about what to do when you have a patient who has chronic hepatitis B. And just to review here, chronic hepatitis B is when you have positive surface antigen for more than six months, okay? There are basically two types of patients with chronic hepatitis B. There are those down here who are E antigen positive and those who are E antigen negative, okay? What is the E antigen? Well, the hepatitis B E antigen tends to represent viral replication. Okay, if you have the E antigen, it suggests that you have more viral replication. If you don't have it, it means you have less viral replication. So those patients with chronic hepatitis B who have E antigen positive, they probably have the worst form of it because they probably are having more viral replication. If your E antigen is negative, that means you're probably having less viral replication. In both these patients, you're going to have chronic hepatitis B. And it's going to be lifelong, unfortunately, because there's no cure for chronic hepatitis B. But there are two different categories uh, separated by the presence of this E antigen, which suggests more viral replication. Okay? So one, two. Those are your two categories. Now let's take a look at someone who has positive E antigens. We're going to go up in this graph here. So if you've diagnosed chronic hepatitis B because they're positive surface antigen, as donated here, and they're E antigen positive. Okay? Now, there are going to be two types of people who are E antigen positive. Those where the immune system doesn't react. So because their immune system doesn't react, we call them immune tolerant. And if you look at their liver enzymes, as represented here in this red line, their ALT levels are nice, normal, and low because there's no inflammation. There's no fighting going on in the liver. And their DNA levels are very high because there's no, again, immune response to try and lower them. And so you're in this immune tolerant phase. Okay. When you're in this immune tolerant phase, because there's not a lot of inflammation and fibrosis going on in the liver, there's not a lot of damage for potentially developing cirrhosis or pathocellular carcinoma. So when that happens and you're in this immune tolerant phase, what we tend to do is we tend to do monitoring. And monitoring is we just do every six months, we retest to see how they're doing. Are they still an immune tolerant or have they moved somewhere more dangerous? And again, right here, we're redoing testing for our three main labs, which is ALT, our DNA levels, and then E antigen, if it's not already positive, just to see if it's how it's doing. 
Now the second scenario if you're hepatitis E antigen positive, and this is a very dangerous one, is if your body does try to start fighting that virus. And so your DNA levels go down here. And because your body's fighting it, there's now an active fight going on. And you notice the active fight leads to more inflammation in the liver, and thus our ALT levels are going up here. And they're higher, there's more risk of fibrosis, cirrhosis development, potential risk for pathocytic carcinoma. And so when you're immune active, this means that we have to consider treatment options. That means we have to probably send them to a hepatologist, consider liver biopsy, potentially treating with different kinds of medications, etc. Okay. What is our goal when we're treating someone with hepatitis E antigen positive? Well, first, we want to get them out of the active phase. We want to get them out of the active phase so there's not a lot of inflammation problems going on, but we're hoping that if we can treat that person, we can convert them from someone who's hepatitis E antigen positive to someone who's negative. We can at least change them from this first category where there's more active viral replication to the second category where there's less. So that's, that's a good goal. We want to try and get them into the second category. Okay. Now let's say we have a patient in the second category. They're now hepatitis E antigen negative. Great. That means they can be in a couple state. They might be in inactive carrier state. So inactive carrier, again, our ALT is nice and low. There's no inflammation. There's no fibrosis, nothing actively going on. And our DNA levels are, are pretty low as well. And so on this graph here, ALT normal, DNA level low, we're in the inactive phase. What are we doing when we're inactive? We're just monitoring. Again, every six months, repeating test of three labs, seeing how that patient's doing. Why are we monitoring them every six months? Because we're afraid up here, they may go into reactivation. And reactivation is again, there's active inflammation, active changes in the liver. You see LFT is going up, DNA level is wandering, and this is bad because this can lead to all kinds of chronic problems. And so if you're active, then again, you have to consider treatment right here. Treatment is perhaps biopsy, seeing how bad things are, different medications, etc. The difficulty with patients is that even if you have a patient in this first phase and you get them to the second phase, there's always a risk that they can become active at any time. Because a B virus can never be cured, that risk is there, and that's what makes this disease so difficult to treat. One final thing I'm going to touch on here, and this is just more... Uh, fun to know than really necessary is that you can have rarely occult hepatitis B infections. In these situations, the occult infection, sometimes you may not actually find a surface antigen, and that's why it's occult. If you have someone with uh, undiagnosed liver cirrhosis or unexplained elevated liver enzymes, it's possible they may have this occult hepatitis B virus uh, infection where the surface antigen is not detectable, but there's something going on there. Okay, let's move on. Once someone's been diagnosed with hepatitis B, there are some general recommendations. Um, and again, this is completed screening. And again, the importance of vaccination in infants and children. This is really true for infants because we saw earlier how high the likelihood is of be acute becoming chronic hepatitis B in children. But once, once we've diagnosed chronic hepatitis B, you want to evaluate and monitor them and those who are in active state or carriers you know, you're monitoring every six months with different lab tests. And for those patients who are having active issues, we want to send them to a liver specialist consultation and consider different treatment options, etc. The other thing to consider is that this is chronic disease, uncurable, and there is a risk for cancer. So you also want to be doing your screening for pedicellular carcinoma, which can be every six months or every year or whatever guidelines are stating at the moment. The last thing I want to touch upon are different treatment options for chronic hepatitis B. Unfortunately, there's no cure. As this graph suggests, treating patients begins with, first of all, no alcohol. You don't want to be drinking because there can be problems with the liver already. Uh, for patients who are considering medications, there's interferons and other meds. And for those who have developed cirrhosis or liver failure, you can always consider a liver transplant. Now, as I mentioned previously, you have two types of chronic hepatitis B. Those are who are E antigen positive when they're having active problems, you want to try and treat them and convert them into E antigen negative. When you're E antigen negative, you're basically living between monitoring when you're inactive versus treating uh, when you go into remission or when your liver uh, begins acting up. Unfortunately, a good number of people with that chronic flux over their lifetime do develop liver cirrhosis. Um, and again, uh, treating that disease is going to be important to help uh, reduce the risk of, uh, of liver failure in the long run. And here is a list of different agents. 
Uh, the gist of this is unfortunately that you know each of these has different advantages and disadvantages and side effects and ultimately long term there's not really a lot of good options uh, for controlling hepatitis B. That's why prevention and vaccination is the most important aspect uh, for preventing uh, people from getting this disease in the first place. Thank you for watching this video lecture. That concludes uh, this talk.